All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Pat. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Dustin Martin from CCS for helping to set this up uh, and uh, for inviting me. So I'm going to talk, obviously, about the topic of searches of mobile devices, digital devices like cell phones, as an incident of arrest. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the background jurisprudence that sort of led to this moment, and then, of course, talk about my, my critical take on Fearon and some of these other cases. Fearon, of course, was very recently decided, late last year, by the Supreme Court of Canada. And just to give you a very brief factual precy in case you're not familiar with it, back in 2009, when cell phones kind of looked more or less like this, police arrested two young black men in Toronto who were suspected of committing an armed robbery of a jeweler now, while she was transferring a bag of jewels into her vehicle. So they quickly identified the likely perpetrators. They had reasonable and probable grounds to believe uh, that these individuals had been involved in the robbery. And so they performed a pat-down search incident to arrest, you know, a frisk search that you're probably all familiar with. And they found one of these mobile phones, actually this exact model, a TELUS G250, I think. Some of you may have opened one at some point. In the front pants pocket uh, of, his, of his pants, obviously. And not only did they remove the phone, but they started looking at its contents. So at this point, keep in mind, they had the RPG to believe that these individuals were involved in the robbery. They didn't believe anyone else was involved, but they had some sort of vague notion that you know, the jewelry might be uh, disposed of quickly, or there might have been some other accomplice who was involved in perhaps hiding the jewelry. So that's why they wanted to look at the contents of his phone. So they looked at the phone, which was not password protected or encrypted in any other way. And they manipulated the keyboard in the usual kind of old-fashioned way to look at recent text and email communications as well as photographs. And they found one draft text message, which I quote in part here. So there's a few spelling mistakes. But the basic translation, at least as the police perceived it, was we did it. In other words, we committed the robbery, and now we want to know where the jewelry is. So suggesting that there may be uh, an accomplice out there and that the jewelry was in danger of perhaps of being disposed of. They also found a photograph, this is not the exact photograph, uh, of a handgun and a bunch of cash. More likely would have been Canadian cash rather than American, but you, know, you do the best you can with Google image searches. So th these were the two pieces of evidence then that the Crown wanted to adduce at trial to help prove identity and the elements of the offense of robbery. The incriminating text message from the phone and the photograph of the exact model of gun that was later found in what police identified as the getaway vehicle. It was not a particularly difficult investigation, relatively quickly and easily solved. Now, to give you a bit of background on the search incident to arrest power so we can understand whether or not cell phones and searches of cell phones really make a difference. Well, the power to search as an incident to arrest is a very long-standing common law police power. It's really the only common law police power that is anything older than 30 years old in, in uh, Canadian uh, experience. So very briefly, what it does is it allows police to search an arrestee's person, belongings, and the immediate vicinity of an arrest. When there's been a lawful arrest, and the search is aimed at uncovering either weapons or evidence relating to the crime. Now, one of the most important things I'll keep coming back to is that this is a common law police power, and as a result, it does not require the obtaining of a warrant before the search occurs. You do not need a warrant in order to search incident to arrest. At least that's the traditional view. What you do need as I mentioned, is firstly a lawful arrest. And what that means in almost all cases is that you've got reasonable and probable grounds for the arrest, which is a fairly high standard, as well as a reasonable basis to think that evidence or weapons will be found as a result of the search. So this is a much, much lower standard. It, you know, it's basically like, is it possible that you might find a weapon or evidence in conducting the search? So, no reasonable and probable grounds to believe that evidence will be found. 
and no requirement for a warrant. Now, I, what I'd like you to do at this point, uh, if you don't mind, if you have a, a laptop or a cell phone connected to the internet, I'd just like to get a sense of what you feel about the case from what I've said, or perhaps what you've read about it uh, to this point. So if you wouldn't mind clicking on this, or well, you can't click on it, I'm going to click on it, uh, just uh, entering that URL. And let's see here, is this going to work? Apparently it's not going to work for me here. Just give me, bear with me for one second. I'm going to see if I can get this to work. <coughs> All right, well, different system, different computer. I guess it's not going to work. Why don't we just go show of hands then, OK? Here is the, here's the question then I want to pose. Very simply, based on what you know so far, how many of you think that what the police did was just fine and dandy, it's cool, doesn't seem problematic? OK, don't be shy. How many of you think, no, there's something wrong with this picture? OK, interesting ratio there. Maybe I'll pull you at the end to see if any of you have changed your minds. So what happens at trial, of course, is that defense counsel objects to the admission of this evidence on the grounds that it violates Section 8 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which protects all of our rights to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure. And then assuming that a, sec a Section 8 violation would be found, the defense would then seek the exclusion of the evidence under Section 24.2 of the Charter, which gives trial judges the discretion to exclude evidence obtained in violation of a charter right. It doesn't have to be excluded. You weigh a bunch of factors. It either goes in or it stays out. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking about fear on. Of course, I'm going to come back to it. And I want to give us a bit of background on what led up to fear on, and what I call the Supreme Court's digital Section 8 jurisprudence. So the cases that have arisen since the emergence of the digital era, computers, smartphones, tablets, et cetera, et cetera. What does that jurisprudence have to say about digital devices, the information that they contain, and the degree of privacy that ought to be attached to digitized information? Well, police have conducted searches and seizures of computers and other digital devices for some time. But the ubiquity, portability, connectivity, and processing and storage capacities of contemporary devices have presented new challenges to the law of search and seizure, including the interpretation and application of Section 8 of the Charter. Now, for some people, digitization is a grave threat to the socio-legal order. Law enforcement officials typically complain that criminals' use of digital technologies has outstripped the investigative capacity of the police, and then they plea and lobby for legislatures and courts to restore what we might call the pre-digital status quo. Let's go back to the way things were. On the other side, privacy advocates also yearn for some kind of restoration, but they claim that digitization has been a boon to the state and to the state's efforts of uh, surveilling uh, our activities online and elsewhere. And so they demand legislation and court rulings to forestall the advance of, of Big Brother. So that's the kind of the dialectic, the dichotomy of the debate. And the Supreme Court of Canada, very smart people, they're aware of this. They're aware of this dynamic. And I think they've done a, a reasonably credible job of laying a foundation for a digital Section 8 jurisprudence that reasonably balances or accommodates these conflicting interests. But I think in the court's two most recent decisions, which I'll seek to elaborate here in a moment, including Fearon, that it's revealed a bit of a crack in this foundation, okay, a, a problem that I think needs to be addressed that I'll talk about. But first, I want to discuss the elements of this foundation that the court has built. And I'm going to focus on two of them and mention the other two only in passing, because they aren't directly relevant to the cases that I want to talk about. The first principle is that computers are different. Digital devices 
differ categorically by an order of magnitude from analog devices. The second is that we do not accept what the Americans call the third party doctrine. The third is the effect of contract and statute and other what we might call exogenous norms in shaping reasonable expectations of privacy. And the fourth is the definition and meaning of what the court has called the biographical core test, the test for deciding whether or not information obtained by a particular investigative technique is inherently intimate and therefore deserving of privacy protection. So let's look at them one by one. Digital or computers are different. So this is the idea that, again, that computers and digital devices are different in kind from their counterparts in the analog world. They're not analogous to physical containers, filing cabinets, briefcases, purses, handbags, et cetera. All those things may contain very detailed and sensitive information, but not in the same volume, the same kind of connectivity uh, that we see with modern digital devices. And the Supreme Court of Canada first started grappling with this, uh, arguably in a case called Morelli, which involved a fairly mundane issue not relevant to our purposes. Uh, but what was interesting is that for the majority, Justice Fish stated the importance of this distinction, of the difference with digital devices in very emphatic terms. It is difficult to imagine, he said, a search more intrusive, extensive, or invasive of one's privacy than a search and seizure of a personal computer. And this is extended in a case called VU. There, the Supreme Court had to decide whether police could search computers and a cell phone found in a residence while they were executing a valid and lawful search warrant. And somewhat surprisingly, the Supreme Court of Canada concluded that even though the warrant said that the police could search for documents, and remember, there's nothing wrong with this warrant, that, 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 that did not empower the police to look for documents or any other materials contained in digital form that they needed specific authorization from the judge before the search occurred in order to start searching through digitized information because of the special nature, the volume of information, the nature of the information that can be contained in digital devices. So you have to have the specific authorization even if you have a warrant to search a resident, residence in order to search computer files. And so we see this, again, sort of emphatic statement from Justice Cromwell that the privacy interests implicated by computer searches are markedly different from analog counterparts uh, and call for distinctive treatment. The third party doctrine, I'm just going to mention very briefly here. This is the idea that if you voluntarily hand over sensitive information to a third party, a service provider, uh, ISP, um, you know, the, somewhere in the, in the computing cloud, that doesn't necessarily extinguish a reasonable expectation of privacy that you might have over that information. In the United States, for the most part, it does. Okay, so this is something that was recognized very early on in Canadian jurisprudence, and you can see why that would be very important in the digital environment. We hand over this kind of information all of the time, and yet we may still expect to maintain a degree of control or confidence confidentiality or protection over that information. That being said, the courts have also recognized that exogenous norms, external norms deriving largely from either contract or statute, can sometimes diminish those expectations. So the question has arisen in several cases as to how do we interpret these rules of so the service agreement that you sign with your service provider, the privacy policies that seem to say that you know, you can't expect privacy or you can't, can't expect privacy. How does that influence our reasonable expectation of privacy and the degree of legal protection that can attach to this information? Well, the courts have kind of gone back and forth on that, but the, the gist of it seems to be the emerging consensus seems to be that we have to be very careful before we ascribe too much importance to these terms because Section 8 is a constitutional provision that guarantees normatively a measure of protection against state surveillance regardless of what we may be told about the degree of privacy that we can expect. The fourth principle is, we'll skip ahead to the fourth, this notion of the biographical core. 
And so this is a very simple idea. It states that we're more likely to want to extend legal privacy protections, like the protection of Section 8 of the Charter, over information that we think is intrinsically or inherently intimate. Now, you might think that this is somewhat of a tautological test, right? It's almost the equivalent of saying we're going to protect private information that is especially private, right? And certainly that's a valid criticism. But like so many other sort of broad legal standards, like reasonableness, um, you know, it works pretty well in the vast majority of cases. We all understand that information about political, religious, sexual activity is inherently more intimate than, you know, which is our favorite sports team, for example. So we can make these kinds of judgments fairly well on a kind of intuitive basis without having a particularly sophisticated legal test. But the problem does arise, and we have several cases illustrating this, when the police use a technique of surveillance that somehow penetrates or infiltrates a realm that we ordinarily associate with a high degree of privacy protection, such as the interior of the home or someone's online activities using a digital device. But the nature of the technique and the quality of the information that is obtained is fuzzy. It has a low resolution. It doesn't directly give us the content of people's activities or communications. It gives us clues. It gives us metadata. It gives us traces. And then we can make some inferences about what maybe is going on or what is happening, but we're not sure. So the debate in the case law and in the academic commentary is, well, how do we draw the lines over how much we protect this kind of information? So the, I, I describe that as being you know, the nature of the probabilistic inferences. So you know, can we infer that someone is doing something intimate because we get a profile of the amount of heat that's being uh, emitted from somebody's home? Uh, as Justice Scalia said in a famous US Supreme Court said, you know, can we infer the time of day that the lady of the house takes her bath? Kind of anachronistic language, I think, but it's, it is Scalia after all. Uh, and is that important? Is that something that we want to protect? Does anyone care whether people outside your home using an infrared camera know when you're taking a bath? Is that intimate activity? So those are the kinds of debates and struggles that the courts have been having. The second point is the virtue, the merits and demerits, the pros and cons of drawing brighter or dimmer lines, demarcating zones of privacy protection from zones where we don't think privacy protection is so important. So some people take the position, including Justice Scalia, that we're better off in most cases with brighter lines. That even if the infrared camera can't really reveal much about what's going on inside the home, it's still information that's coming from the home. And the home is private. So we have a bright line. It's simple. You can't gain any information from the interior of a residence without a warrant. That makes things simple. The other way of looking at it is to say, well, come on. Let's look at each technology. Let's look, look at each technique as it comes along. And then we'll make a judgment call. Costs, benefits. Is this information really usable? Is it relevant? Is it intimate? If not, then we shouldn't prevent the police from gaining access to it and imposing onerous requirements, such as having to obtain a warrant before they gain access to it. So this issue once again came to a head in the second most recent case on digital Section 8 uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada. That's a case called Spencer. And Spencer, the court had to, deal, had to answer the question whether the subscriber information associated with electronic communications attracts a reasonable expectation of privacy. And that's important because if you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, there's no protection under Section 8. Unless there's some statutory rule, the police can engage in that kind of surveillance without restriction. And they don't need to get a warrant. They can do it any time that they want. The police often need this subscriber information, which consists of you know, simple information like the, the name of the registered owner of the modem or the cell phone or the phone or whatever it is, uh, maybe their address, billing information, and maybe a username. But it doesn't contain any what we call metadata addressing information about when communications were sent or received or how big the file was, or, and it certainly doesn't uh, 
consist of any content information, information about you know, what communications we send back and forth, photographs, subject headings, anything of that nature, anything that has direct communicative content. So we're just talking about the subscriber information, kind of the, the digital equivalent of the information on the outside of a paper envelope using the old snail mail. So that was the issue. Is this subscriber information protected? And as in many cases on this question, the factual scenario involved police who were trolling for people trading child pornography online. So these are publicly available websites or peer-to-peer -peer networks where child porn files are uploaded and downloaded. So you can see that. Anyone can see that. It's public. There's no privacy protection. But of course, people are doing this anonymously. And so we find what the IP address is, again, using publicly available means. No problem there. We trace that IP address to a particular service provider that issued it, like Shaw. And then we go to Shaw and say, tell us who was using or whose computer or modem was using that IP address at the relevant time. And as was the case for almost all requests involving child exploitation offenses, Shaw said, sure. They handed it over without a warrant without any legal um, or court authorization. So the question is, does that invade a reasonable expectation of privacy and hence violate Section 8? Well, the Supreme Court of Canada held that indeed this did invade a reasonable expectation of privacy and was a violation of Section 8. And in deciding that, Justice Cromwell, again, writing for a unanimous court, said that by obtaining this information, what the police did was pierce the anonymity of the user of the internet. And that this would somehow enable the police to then gain access to and trace, maybe retrospectively, maybe prospectively, his online activities. And so this presented a significant threat to privacy that was deserving of protection under Section 8 and would generally then oblige the police to obtain a warrant before they could get subscriber information. OK, so with that by way of background, we can maybe reduce the state of the law immediately prior to Fearon to the following perhaps simplistic equation. We have this very strong recognition by big majorities of the Supreme Court that digital is different. It's special. We've got acute privacy concerns that go beyond the concerns that we conventionally had in the analog world. Combine that with the fact that information on a cell phone, even a 2009 cell phone, is undeniably intimate, undeniably part of the heart of the biographical core. We're not talking just about subscriber information here. We're not talking just about metadata, you know, where your cell phone pinged a particular tower at what time. We're talking about actual communications content, right? And so one might have predicted, especially when we think about what the court said in VU, about having to have specific authorization even when you have a warrant to search digital devices. Most people were predicted, myself included, that police would have been forbidden from searching digital devices incident to arrest. In other words, they'd have to get a warrant before they could search your cell phone, even if you had been arrested. And then we find out that the author of the majority decision in Fearon was Justice Cromwell. He said all these wonderful things about protecting privacy. Then you know, your, your feeling, your prediction, would almost be like a lock. Like, how could we lose this case? But instead, he says, no problem. Go for it. Okay, search incident to arrest extends to not only seizing a cell phone, but conducting a search. So this was the prediction. right? The Supreme Court would say, you need a warrant. This is what the United States Supreme Court had held just a few months before in a remarkably similar case called Riley uh, against California. So. We have Justice Cromwell saying, no, we're going to go in a different direction. Now, he did recognize that while we're going to permit police to conduct these kinds of searches, we're going to place some limitations. 
First, we're only going to allow police to look for recent content, like text, email, photos, call logs. We're only going to permit these searches for serious offenses, he said. And we're only going to permit them if police can show that their investigation would be stymied or significantly hampered unless we permitted the police to search the mobile digital device. And lastly, he said, we're also going to require police from this point forward to take detailed notes of the details of the search. So why did you decide to search? What kind of search did you perform? What information did you collect or observe during the course of the search? In dissent for three judges, uh, it was a four to three decision, Justice Karakatsanis said no. We're not going to permit these cell phone searches for the reasons that you would expect that we've kind of already mentioned, except in exigent circumstances. And this is an exception that applies to all warrant searches under warrant. So if you have a situation where normally you would need to get a warrant before searching, if you can demonstrate that there is an imminent danger of the loss or destruction of evidence or an imminent risk to public sa safety, then you can go ahead and conduct the search without a warrant. But it's a very stringent and onerous standard. Really, you really do have to have some objective, concrete reason to believe that evidence, for example, is in imminent danger of being lost or destroyed. Now we kind of get to what I think is the juicy part. Why do I think, as I do, that the court got both of these cases wrong? erring too far on the side of protecting privacy in Spencer and not going far enough to protect privacy in Firon. So in the remainder of my time, my limited time, I'm going to first explain why I think the decisions were incorrect on sort of the usual grounds of, of doctrine and policy. And then I'm going to speculate, and I admit that it is speculation, as to what I think are some of the social psychological reasons why the court ruled in the way that it did. Now recall that the court's concern in Spencer, the subscriber records case, the child porn case, that the Supreme Court kind of used the metaphor of the key. That if we get the subscriber information, we're going to pierce anonymity, and this will give us a key that unlocks this treasure trove of information about online activity. So you know, one of the biggest fears we have about the Big Brother state and mass surveillance, you know, like NSA style stuff. But as it turns out, this is factually and technologically misleading. The evidence at trial showed that the subscriber information only allowed the police to connect Mr. Spencer's online activity with a very specific moment in time, i.e. the time that he was trading kitty porn. It did not give them the ability to go back in time or forward in time to find out what he was doing on the internet at any other point in time. So the linking, the connection, the key, gave police access to very little additional information about the suspect's online activities. Now, the court kind of alluded to the fact that, it's very fuzzy on this point, that, well, you know, maybe there's capacity to do this somehow. That, you know, maybe not in this particular case, but, you know, we, we hear about all these incredible technological capabilities for data mining and tracing, and we just don't want to open that window. Fair enough. But as it turns out, ordinary police officers and ordinary law enforcement agencies just simply don't have the ability to take an IP address and go searching through the internet and find out what people are, have been doing at any particular point in time. It's well beyond a needle and a haystack. And to the extent that there are, there are speculative or even possible capabilities, well, why not regulate those forms of surveillance when and if they arise? So in previous cases, the Supreme Court has taken the position that you know, we're not going to be like the US Supreme Court and draw these bright lines that don't make any sense. We're going to look at the actual technological capacity of the surveillance technique that is before us and make a decision as to whether or not it reveals any intimate activity. 
And arguably, in Spencer, there was no intimate activity revealed other than the fact that he was trading child pornography. And surely, that's not the kind of intimate activity that we want to protect with privacy law. You know, it's an inherently wrongful and criminal form of conduct. So that's why I think the court went too far in Spencer. Requiring a warrant to get this very basic subscriber information potentially precludes the police and stymies the police in advancing investigations that are at a very early stage. So they may have some suspicions and incriminating information relating to someone. They don't know who that someone is. So they need that basic subscriber information, you know, the equivalent of the name in the white pages, in order to advance their investigation. And if they don't have that, it may be difficult for them to obtain a warrant. And given what I characterize as the very low or minimal level of inherent intimacy attaching to that information, I don't think that that's a major problem. The problem with fear on is really the converse. It's the 180. Because police are now able to obtain not just subscriber information, not just metadata, which can be quite revealing, but actual communicative expressive conduct. Right? There's really no limit to the amount of information that police can obtain from your mobile digital device. And no one's arguing that this is not intimate information. Now, it might be argued on the other side that, well, that's OK, because in Fearon, we're dealing with an arrest. So we have reasonable and probable grounds to believe that this person has committed a criminal offense. And according to the majority in Fearon, a serious criminal offense, right? because we can't do search is incident to arrest of digital devices without that criterion of seriousness. But here's the problem as I see it. At no point in this process do we have any form of prior judicial authorization, i.e. a warrant. Why are warrants so important? Well, as far back as Hunter and Southam, still the most important Section 8 case and one of the most important cases ever decided by the Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Dixon, as he then was, stressed the importance of warrants and the prior authorization requirement because it and it alone has the capacity to prevent unjustified searches before they occur. Right? Police, quite rightly and understandably, have very strong incentives to advance the investigation, to collect the evidence, and to intrude into privacy to accomplish those goals. Personal privacy and protecting personal privacy is far down on the list of their priorities. And that's the way it's always been, and that's the way it always will be. And so we need a neutral arbiter, and right, someone who's capable of acting impartially to weigh the relative merits of intrusion versus privacy and decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether justification exists for intruding into privacy. And indeed, the empirical record confirms the, the intuition of the common law, which is that searches that are performed without warrants, based on the discretion of police, even if it's based on probable grounds or reasonable probable grounds, are much more likely to be unsuccessful, to not uncover any evidence of illegality. In other words, you know, they're false positives. Innocent people are much more likely to be intruded upon by a search that's conducted without a warrant as compared to one that received prior judicial authorization. So if we're going to have warrantless searches, we're going to have to be prepared to tolerate a much higher rate of false positives and a much greater impact on the privacy of people who have done nothing wrong. So that's the reason why warrants are so important to why I think a warrant should have been required in all but exigent circumstances in Furon. Now, you may still be asking, what about all those carefully crafted, nuanced limitations on the power to search digital devices incident to arrest? Those seem quite sensible. Seem like Justice Cromwell was, was concerned about the, uh, the ability of police to perhaps abuse this power. Well, let's look at those again. Recent content. OK, well, what do we mean by recent? We talk in five minutes. We talking five hours. We talking five days. 
Are we talking five weeks? We have absolutely no idea. Oh, sure, maybe the courts will work out some rough guidelines over the next years. There's still going to be rough guidelines. Courts are loath to use quantitative metrics in these realms to say, oh, you can search up to an hour and a half, but that's it. They almost never do that. So inevitably, this is going to remain incredibly indeterminate and difficult for the police to apply. <coughs> serious offenses. What's a serious offense? What criminal code offense isn't serious? Like, what does that mean? How are the police going to decide that? How do you think the police are going to err if they're going to err? In which direction? The information must have been stymied without the search. What do we mean? We're talking about efficiency, convenience, so we think that maybe there's an accomplice. We don't really know, but there could be. Uh, you know, it's jewelry. It could be disposed of. It could be fenced. It could be sold. Uh, there's a gun on the streets. That's what Justice Cromwell said. There was a gun on the streets. Trust me, there are lots and lots of guns on the streets. That doesn't come anywhere close to constituting exigent circumstances. You need evidence that someone had the gun and had plans to use it imminently. None of that evidence existed. What does that mean? Again, gross indeterminacy. Detailed notes. Well, that's nice. We all want the police to compile detailed notes. That's good. But what does it really do to help the police decide accurately before the fact whether they should be entitled to search? So you know, as John McEnroe liked to put it, you cannot be serious with these limitations. How in God's name are the police supposed to administer these grossly indeterminate guidelines in the heat of the moment when they have to decide within seconds whether they have legal authority to look through a cell phone or not. Okay, it's, it's bizarre that the Supreme Court of Canada would have thought that this was workable as a practical matter. So now we get to the, and I'm going to extend my, my talk here just for a couple more minutes because I think that to me this is the most interesting part. You may disagree. The question then is why? You know, why did the court get it wrong? Well, you know, maybe they just disagreed with me. They, they get to rule I don't, okay? But I think there might be the beginnings of an explanation, or at least part of the explanation. What kinds of people are most likely to be affected or perceive that they are affected by the two different types of intrusions that we've been talking about, right? The search instant to arrest and the request for subscriber information. Well, in the case of requests for subscriber information, perception may be that this kind of surveillance, whether we think it's heavy-handed surveillance or nothing to worry about, potentially affects almost everyone. Right? Almost everybody uses digital devices and does stuff online. And so it has the potential to protect a broad swath of the community. So you know, people could look like anyone. Could people look like this woman? Could look like this guy? Could even look like these folks all concerned about their online privacy. Worried, perhaps, I'm not saying this is something that they ought to worry about, but worried, perhaps, that while they don't engage in any criminal activity online, maybe they do some things online that, uh, and I'm not specifically referring to this gentleman by any stretch of the imagination, that they wouldn't want other people to know about. You know, stuff that's embarrassing or stigmatizing, intimate information, you don't want your spouse to know, you don't want other people to know. It's not criminal, it's not illegal, but you wouldn't want the state maybe finding out about this. You don't know how that information might be used or disclosed. What about people who are likely to be subjected to searches of their cell phones as an incident of arrest? What do they look like? Disproportionately, they look like these guys, or like this guy, or even like this guy. You may, rec may or may not recognize this Canada's own Justin Bieber. Okay. <laughs> People who are arrested, especially for arrests involving frisk searches, so let's take away our impaired drivers, okay, overwhelmingly are young men and disproportionately young men of color. And maybe the fact that we have this very high level of protection for 
subscriber information. And this kind of, let's be generous, moderate level protection for searches incident to arrest has something to do with the images that you see before you. That's my speculation. That's my hypothesis. One last layer to this, and I promise I'll end here. And that's the layer of the relationship between the courts and parliament. Now, if people who look like this really are discomfited by the prospect of police having unregulated access to subscriber information, being able to pierce anonymity, and then to use that information, then guess what? You have ready means to do something about it. Talk to your MP, lobby, raise money, try to get legislation passed. Oh, no, you can't do that. This is a law and order conservative government. Forget about it. They don't care about the rights of criminal defendants and suspects. Well, guess what? The historical record in this country and in the United States shows that when it comes to certain kinds of intrusions into privacy, legislatures historically have been very protective and have responded to lobbying and perception that Big Brother is getting too big. In which situations? Precisely the situation in Spencer, when there's a perception that ordinary people are being affected. Especially, think about who disproportionately uses digital devices. Technologically savvy, above average incomes, politically influential. Get legislation if that's what you want. Okay. On the other hand, and we've seen that with the demise of various lawful access bills over the years from the previous liberal government as well as the current conservative government. Absolute public outcry. You can't do this. It's big brother. I thought most of the stuff was pretty innocuous. Didn't see the light of day. And national security might be a separate issue. I grant you that. But when it comes to ordinary domestic law enforcement, courts have been very, I mean, the legislature has been very reluctant to give police broad new powers when it comes to technology. On the other hand, those are most, who are most likely to be subject to cell phone searches have very little political influence. Okay? And it's protecting the interests of these kinds of people, according to John Hart Ely's famous thesis in Democracy and Distrust, that is one of the strongest justifications for robust judicial intervention to protect privacy in the realm of criminal justice. So I'll end there. I apologize for going a little over there. I apologize for the snafu. Glad that we got it resorted. And of course, we'll edit that in post, as they say. And I guess we have time for just a few questions. Thank you very much.